Hey guys, this is uh, Dr. Kimon Beckel, is director of the Stroke and Brain Aneurysm Center of Long Island, coming to you today with a very requested topic. A lot of you guys want to know about memory, how does it work, how does the brain really store new memories, how do we learn all the things that we learn in life, right? You know, what, what memory is, is the ability of the brain to recall information, processes, or skills and uh, it's really a, an extremely complex topic. It's uh, not an exaggeration to say that hundreds of books and, and papers have been written on the topic of memory, uh, and we do have a fair bit of understanding of how memory works, but we really uh, are just on the surface uh, of, uh, of this understanding. And so, you know, I guess there's two components when it comes to memory. One is perceiving the initial information by our brain and eventually uh, learning or storing that information so that it turns into long-term memories. Thinking of the brain, I think it's a, a good analogy to think of a computer, of course. Um, I would say the brain would be the most complex computer we could ever uh, think of or, or uh, perceive or maybe we will never be able to come up with a computer as complex as the brain. But in any event, what happens is during uh, our daily life when we are awake, we receive a, a certain number of information. Some of it uh, we actively are trying to remember, say we're studying for a test, so we're trying to remember that, that information. Other information we're not really actively trying to remember, we're just living our life. The former um, information, the one that we're actively trying to remember, uh, our hippocampus, which is the, uh, the short-term memory uh, processing unit of the brain, perceive initially, and you know all these memories uh, will be stored uh, or, or uh, in a, in a short-term fashion will be stored in the brain. Now, what happens when we go to sleep actually is when we're learning. So, so this information will be in our brain both the ones that we were trying to maintain in our brain, but also the ones that are randomly happening. You know, your, your interaction with somebody who's selling coffee, or you know, your, you know, the song that you heard, or other things that are you know, in our brain that for one reason or another, they will eventually end up being permanent and uh, more long-term memories. So when we sleep, what happens is the brain chooses from the, the large number of information that was stored in there, uh, like only the uh, not only the voluntary um, information but also the involuntary information that we perceive during the day and to some extent it chooses in quotations what information to keep and what what, what pieces of information to discard and the pieces of information that are kept turn into um, long-term memories now this uh, at an anatomy or or, um, or microscopic level uh, looks more like building connections between the individual neurons of, of the brain, right? You know, the brain is one of those organs where anatomy is really heavily related to function. And anatomy at the microscopic level, it's something that we do not really have a good grasp on. Uh, we know that, you know, these neurons or, or these individual units, think of them as cables that are connecting uh, information in the brain they form new connections constantly, and that's the process of memory building. If you are creating these networks in the brain of connected neurons that then, when they get fired up, they produce that memory again, that's, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about retrieval of, um, of that piece of information. And, and so, when we're sleeping, the brain really discards and stores information, so then you form those connections, those synapses, you form them uh, in a much more effective and robust way. Now, what memories are going to get stored versus discarded uh, is a is an interesting um, is an interesting notion, especially since the brain chooses, so to speak, what stays and what goes. And generally, the things that stay in our brain are those that are not they're not just a piece of information. They're more so related with other sensory input for the brain. So, say for example. You've had an experience that's associated with a particular smell, but also with a particular emotion. That creates multiple connections in multiple centers of the brain. And that makes for a more robust memory eventually because it's not just a single piece of information, just a visual cue, but it's a visual, sensory, um, uh, and emotional cue. And then you have all that connection 
uh, and that visceral response sometimes to uh, store that memory. So it's really important, for example, especially when you're learning, right? Um, just trying to memorize uh, lines on a paper, um, it might not work because eventually these, this is, these are weak type of connections that the, for, that the brain is going to form. You want to, when you're learning, you want to have some, um, uh, ex uh, some, some experiential uh, connection uh, with, uh, with what you're learning, you know, connected with another memory in your brain, connected with some sort of emotion, connected um, with a visual cue at the same time, uh, connected with an example. So all these different uh, forms um, of uh, input for that piece of information will be so important to make sure it's stored and it turns into long-term memory, right? So that process is uh, extremely challenging, but of course, uh, folks through their experience they've come to realize that learning is more effective uh, when you see something even more effective when you do something because then you have more centers of the brain engaging in the building of that memory again it's all about building those connections and building robust connections that are difficult um, to break over time that are difficult to be changed by the brain um, and, and so really really interesting concepts and 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 also when you're learning, a lot of people, you know, an expectation of an exam, they'll cram and then they're going to skip on sleep potentially. And that's obviously the wrong way to go by. You need sleep to learn. No sleep equals no long-term memory. That's maybe one of the most important functions when it comes to sleep, that it allows us to learn and it allows us to shape our memories and our personalities, of course. Now, there's another... Uh, memory that I want, or, or type of memory I want to talk a little bit about that's a little different than um, all the issues that I've been talking about already. And that has to do with learning a new skill. Um, for example, learning how to play the piano or learning how to do surgery in the case of, uh, of a surgeon. That's a, a, a piece of information that's stored in multiple different ways and in multiple parts of the brain. So, so these procedural or technical memories or skills or knowledge is, is stored initially uh, when you're actively learning and you're using your brain to understand the process and how to move your hands, say when you're playing the piano, that's going to be all part of the brain itself uh, or what we call the supratentorial compartment of the brain, the conscious compartment of the brain. When you develop a certain level of mastery or, of your skill, that will become to some extent, like we say, second nature, right? And second nature means that that memory will be stored now in your cerebellum or that skill will be stored in the cerebellum or the infratentorial compartment. The supratentorial compartment is the part of the brain that sits right on top of uh, the skull cavity, whereas the, the infratentorial compartment or the cerebellum is at the back part of your head. And in that area, now you have this learned skill and, and you're a master of the craft. So you have a stroke uh, and that can affect part of the brain uh, and then maybe you cannot really learn new skills because you cannot really store those new memories. Uh, but your, the skills that you already had mastered, you can use them because, say, the cerebellum, where that function uh, is, is not affected by the, by the stroke. And so a lot of people ask me, and maybe I'll close with that, how does, really, uh, how does stroke affect memory and do we see memory loss with stroke? We do. Uh, and it all depends on where the stroke is. Now, there's no particular center in the brain that we would deem, say, the, the memory center, other than the hippocampus, where we know, of course, in the hippocampus, you, you might have trouble with short-term memory. And we've seen strokes that will affect short-term memory if they're strategically positioned in that hippocampal area. But, but short of that area, any stroke can cause uh, memory disturbances, and that's because memories are not stored in one particular part of the brain, especially long-term or, or or, or medium-term memories are stored everywhere, right? There's no particular location. Memories, like I said, when it comes down to what they really are, they're connections. And so those connections can be between different parts of the brain. And so a stroke can cause disruption in those connections. And of course, uh, memories can be uh, disturbed. But the good thing about, um, about the brain is that it exhibits, when it comes to memory, a certain level of plasticity. Plasticity means it can change over time. So of course, you can generally overcome memory challenges when it comes to stroke, when the stroke is say an isolated single event. 
But when it comes to say multiple strokes in multiple key areas of the brain, then you end up in a situation where you cannot really overcome those multiple hits in multiple networks of the brain. And then you can get in a condition called multi-infarct dementia, where the multiple strokes that you have had, some of them might have been very, very small. And frankly, some patients would not even know that they've had so many strokes because uh, they are minor, they're in areas that do not affect something loud like speech or movement. But adding all those strokes together, you disrupt so many different pathways in the brain and eventually the communications that produce the memory output are not there. So you, you can develop dementia and there's no real good treatment for this type of dementia because of that profound impact on the connectivity or the circuitry of the brain. That again is called multi-infarct dementia. So with that, I want to close again, you know, I hope I shed a little bit of light into a very, very complex problem that's under, understood only at its surface. Uh, of course, if you have any questions, reach out to us, like and subscribe our videos. I'll see you again in another video of our channel.